Well, it is sure good to see everyone today. Um, for those of you that missed the video in the beginning, those were pictures from our youth camp this year, and it was absolutely fantastic. I went up there on Wednesday and got to spend most of my, my well, 12 hours up there and, and uh, or close, and it was absolutely wonderful. The speaker was fantastic. It was well organized. The food was terrific. Everything was just absolutely great. They did a wonderful job. And uh, in that day that I was there, I thought it was hilarious. Um, I've got one of those tracker things. I walked 8.1 miles, uh, 74 flights of stairs, burned 5,200 calories, and, uh, and stayed active all day long, uh, 200 and something minutes of activity. So it was absolutely wonderful. And as we started and, and prepared for the worship and for the music and for the sermon today, uh, and as, as as I studied the Word of God, I thought maybe we would start off on something that was just a little lighter, kind of kind of just felt like that. It was uh, it was the week for it, I think. Uh, but many years ago, Tim Allen made a movie called The Santa Claus. Anybody remember it? It was one of my favorites. And and uh, uh, whatever you want to do with Santa is okay with me. But but. I like the movie, and, and while I'd like to show you the bigger clip, it, it just puts too much context in it and, and maybe just kind of, you know, takes the focus off of the word from where we want it today. But I do like what happens when he, he first gets to the North Pole, and he's looking around, and he sees all of these things, and he's just having trouble dealing with what his eyes see. And so he's having to ask the question both of himself uh, and of others of what do I do with this? What do I do with all that I see here? And this little elf, Judy, comes to his rescue and she offers an opinion and uh, we've got it here and we'll see what you think. <laughs> seeing isn't believing. Believing is seeing. Isn't it that way sometimes with God as well? There are so many things that happen around us all the time. And for those that do not believe, for those that will not believe, all of the evidence in the world is not enough to convert them to Jesus Christ. Ultimately, it comes down to faith and trust and belief and, and receiving the revelation, which is um, God revealing or God showing himself to us, receiving that revelation and, and choosing to follow him. And so today the title of my sermon is just simply Believing is Seeing, uh, because I think um, it is awful important for us to choose what we're going to do with how God has revealed himself to us today. If you have your Bibles, would you open them up to Matthew chapter 21, verse 23 and following? Could you turn my mic up just a hair? <clears throat> when he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? Jesus answered them, I will also ask you one question, and if you answer it for me, then I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Did John's baptism come from heaven, or was it of human origin? They discussed it among themselves. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, because everyone considers John to be a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you, Lord, that we can ask questions, but we thank you, Lord, that you've already given us the answer that we need, that there is a way to deal with the most pressing problem of humanity, or the gap that is caused by sin between you and us. We thank you that you have solved that in Jesus Christ, and we thank you, Lord, that we can have assurance and confidence of the future, knowing totally and completely and absolutely that we can spend eternity with you. We thank you that you love us, and we thank you that you reveal yourself to us. For your glory and honor, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So the first point today is that religion devoid of belief is skepticism. Now, I know there's maybe a few big words there, but I, but I liked them. Uh, I like them as opposed to saying that it was lacking uh, because religion without belief is nothing more than a series of questions. And so <clears throat> we have seen, leading into this, the triumphal entry. We have seen the cleansing of the temple, the healing of the disabled, the praises of the children in the temple. And now the chief priests and the elders come and they want to challenge Jesus. Now, the identity of those two groups are very interesting. First, the chief priests, and the chief priests are the same word as that we get high priest from. So in Greek, it's identical. And so um, it can be a little bit of con- uh, a little bit confusing there. But these are those that were high in rank and served in the Sanhedrin. And if you remember, the Sanhedrin are the 71 uh, that sat in the ruling religious council. They were, there was normally a, a Sadducee that was in charge as the high priest. Uh, the Pharisees served in, in many cases as well. There were some scribes, a subsect of the, of the, the Pharisees. And there were some lay people, uh, elders from the tribes and the community, that all also served. So the elders in particular are a group of diverse backgrounds from priests to financial big shots and and generally come from the Sadducee uh, Sadducean point of view. They're they're conservative, they're politically uh, motivated, and for the most part, let's just be honest, they're mostly sellouts when it comes to religion. Uh, The Sadducees don't believe in hardly anything. They don't believe in an afterlife. They don't believe in a resurrection. They they hardly believe in any kind of angels or anything in heaven. Um, And and so we always say, right, they don't believe in the resurrection. That is why they are sad, you see. And so... It just works. It's a, it's an easy way to remember. The Pharisees, on the other hand, we remember them, right? Uh, very strict, very religiously orthodox, uh, wanting to do what is right. And so these people, these elders, like Joseph of Arimathea would have been one, um, are, are coming to the, to the table in the Sanhedrin to bring a diverse uh, political, tribal, social, um, uh, point of view with them. But at this time, it had changed. And during the time of Jesus, it had narrowed significantly. And really, we see the Sadducees ruling. We see a handful of scribes. We see some elders in the community, but they had narrowed it so that if you weren't of Judea, you weren't of the tribe of Judah, you were not able to serve. And so they had narrowed the 12 tribes down to one tribe. And so basically then what you've got in these chief priests and elders coming is you've got um, a, a very small politically oriented group of people with very limited views that have come to challenge Jesus. Now, it does make sense that they're there to challenge Jesus. They're the supreme religious authority in the land. They held religious court, general discussions. They determined how to deal with theological differences and questions and problems, you know, like Jesus. He was a problem to them. And so these members of the Sanhedrin come to Jesus and they ask him two things. And what they ask him is fascinating. First, by what authority are you doing these things? And then secondly, who gave you this authority? Now, remember, everyone that taught during this time taught with someone else's authority, right? It was commonplace of the day for the rabbis to to teach and to say, Rabbi so-and-so says this. Rabbi so-and-so says that you can't carry a sewing needle in your shirt on the Sabbath because that is a burden and it violates the the, the Ten Commandments. And so by asking what authority (coughs) that he is doing these things makes sense in a general way, but it's also fitting considering what Jesus had been doing. Jesus had just overturned tables in in the temple. He had driven people out of the temple. He had healed on the Sabbath. He had forgiven sins. He had rebuked the chief priest. Jesus had ignored social rules about men and women and even minimized ceremonial rules about washing your hands and being clean to make a point. Jesus told the religious that they were sinners, that they needed to be baptized in John's baptism of repentance, that they were full of death like whitewashed tombs. 
Jesus told some of them that their father was the devil and that they were awaiting punishment and they were stumbling blocks to the nation of Israel. Jesus had done all these things publicly, hadn't he? If you were a religious leader of the day, how are you feeling right about now? When you put it all together, you had to be challenged. Jesus intended to challenge them. You better believe that the chief priests want to know by what authority he does these things. Uh, not with just a few things, but his entire ministry had been countercultural. Jesus had also told them not to believe and not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus used the I am statements the same as the Yahweh statements or the I am statements of Exodus claiming to be God himself, the God of the Old Testament, the God of Moses and Abraham and Joseph and Jacob. Not in that order. And so they ask, how can you do this? And secondly, who told you you can do this? I love that question. Not only by what authority, but who told you this is okay? Because clearly Jesus is functioning outside of the norm here. And I, and I love the response of Jesus. You know, they, they are asking, how do you get to be this person that brings condemnation to us? Who are you that you get to come here and condemn us? Are you one of the prophets? Are you a messenger of God? Are you anybody of anything? You're from Nazareth. Just like with many of the prophets of the Old Testament, Jesus and God's truth are rejected overwhelmingly. And so the chief priests come. They come with what they have, a whole bunch of questions. They've rejected what they've been told. They have failed to believe. They have done exactly what the Israelites did to the prophets. They rejected them. They persecuted them. They murdered them. But that leaves them with virtually nothing but a, use, a useless religious system devoid of belief. You know what? Religion without God is absolutely useless. Religion without God gives you a bunch of questions, but no answers that are of any value. And that's what they have done. They have removed God. They have removed Jesus from the equation, from their system of belief. We, on the other hand, need to take what we have been given and believe. We should take what God has revealed to us and accept it, believe it, and be blessed. Think about how it was with Thomas, the disciple. He walks with Jesus, but when it came down, with, down to it, he wanted more, didn't he? Just the, the, the three years that he spent with Jesus, at least three years that he spent with Jesus, should have been enough for him to understand and for him to believe and for him to trust. But what happens after the resurrection? Don't we get doubting Thomas? John 20, 24 and following. But Thomas, called twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were telling him, We've seen the Lord, but he said to them, if I don't see the mark of the nails in his hands and put the finger into the mark of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will never believe. And then all the way to the last verse. And, and uh, <coughs> go ahead and keep going all the way to the end of that, those verses right there. Jesus does show up. Jesus does give him more, um, but, but it is not a, a, a good thing that he requires more. And in fact, Jesus would tell him, look at that last verse. Jesus says, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. A theological version of our, our, the quote that we started with today. Jesus is best seen through eyes of belief, not through proof. For those that want Jesus to prove himself to them, it's not going to happen. It always requires faith, and it's faith that God gives us through his grace, or saved by grace through his faith. You know, what we are offering here at church, what we are offering here at First Southern Tucson is not a belief system. What we have to offer is Jesus himself and a relationship with him. And by his grace and according to his blessed will, we will do that for everybody that comes into this door. We will at least make that offer. Anything less than Jesus is just empty religion and tradition. 
And so our second point today is that rejecting revelation is a poor reason to ask for more. Now, the second point is pretty simple. They come to Jesus and they essentially say, we don't believe in you. We challenge your authority. So tell us more. Isn't that great? How many, how many times do you think that actually works with God? I don't trust in you. I don't believe in you. I don't accept you. I don't, I don't believe in any of the things you have done. So prove yourself to me. As if God is required to do that. In verse 24 and 5, Jesus responds to this by giving them a question that will reveal to them what's really going on. And, and you always just love the responses of Jesus because they're always so masterful. He, he is, he is the, the perfect evangelist. He is the perfect apologist. Um, and he shows them what's really going on. Now, it was common for a rabbi to ask, uh, ask a question in response to a question. You ask a question, he answers with a question, and he makes you think. Uh, we still see this today in certain kind of categories of, uh, of work, right? We go to the doctor, doctor, you know, I'm, I'm feeling totally anxious. I think I'm a chicken. Well, how does that make you feel? How do you feel about being a chicken, right? Um, or, or the guy that comes to the therapist and he says, you know, doctor, I, I, you know, my wife thinks she's a refrigerator. And he says, well, why does that bother you? And he says, well, she sleeps with her mouth open and the light keeps me up all night. You know, it just a little bit of a, <laughs> I'm sorry, that is probably inappropriate. I, I'm not even sure. It just, just a little bit of probing question, right? Just a little bit. Jesus is just pushing the limit to make them think. He's just pushing them a little farther to get them to think about what's actually going on here. So by asking about John, Jesus is showing them that they have already rejected God's revelation. And by doing so, their unbelief is just the continuation of rejection. Does that make sense to you? God has already revealed himself. They have rejected it, and now they want more. Jesus is saying, if you would have believed John, God's prophet, and the spirit of Elijah, then you would have known who I am already and by what authority I come in. But you have rejected God's revelation, and your skepticism and hatred come from your hard heart. Jesus is showing them the same thing that God showed the Israelites throughout, uh, throughout history, through Pharaoh. The same thing he showed them in the desert. The same thing God showed them during the period of the judges and the prophets. When you reject God's revelation, you ultimately reject God himself. All you're left with then is an empty religion with no real answers to life's most difficult questions. And truthfully, that's just the beginning. When you reject the revelation of God, you set yourself up to be the opponent of God. In direct conflict with him. One of the strongest warnings in the entire Bible, in my opinion, it, it, there are many, but concerning this concept of rejecting revelation, and let's make sure we understand what revelation is, but there's two kinds, right? There is general revelation like Psalms, uh, and Psalm 19 says, or, or uh, uh, Colossians, or, or Romans, um, where God reveals himself in the heavens where we can look into the heavens and we just know that there is a God, that we can look into the beauty of a newborn child and just know uh, that this is not an accident, um, that we can just see the order of the universe, the way that the earth spins, how far we are from the moon, the sun, uh, everything necessary to sustain life, that it just didn't happen by accident. God is there. He's holding everything together. But then there's specific revelation as well, where, where God specifically reveals himself to you. Everyone has general revelation, and everyone by that general revelation has enough information to seek out God and to respond to him and to throw themselves on his mercy. Now, specific revelation is where God reveals himself, like through the Bible or through prayer, or where God speaks to you in a circumstance or in a sermon or in a friendship or in a family member, where God touches your heart and he tries to get a hold of you and he shows himself to you. God has revealed himself in so many different ways. 
And all of us have had God revealed to us, to us in one way or another. And so Romans chapter 1 tells us what happens when we reject that. And it's a little bit longer, but it's totally valid and totally worth reading. For God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Since what can be known about God is evident among them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, that is his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. For though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became worthless and their senseless hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. Therefore, God delivered them over to the desires of their heart, to sexual impurity, so that their bodies were degraded among themselves. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served what has been created instead of the Creator, who is praised forever. Amen. They rejected God's revelation, what God showed them, and then they have the audacity to ask for more. Jesus shows them that, and we see their debate in verse 26, don't we? Well, we can't acknowledge God's hand upon John, and we can't say that John was from man, so uh, (laughs) we don't know. You know, God has spoken to them. They ignored it. We need to make sure that it's not the same way with us. Hebrews starts by saying, God has spoken to us in all of these ways in the past, but now he has spoken to us through his son, perfectly revealed in Jesus Christ. If you reject the son, you have no business thinking that you deserve more revelation. If you reject the son, you are rejecting God. The answer isn't to ask for another sign like so many people do. The answer is to pray like the man who brought his daughter to Jesus. I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. If you find yourself there today, then let me assure you that there's still hope because God has shown us a right way as well. And even better, God wants us to have life. And we can by his grace and power. And that brings us to our last point. Embrace the truth and you shall see. In verse 27, we see that Jesus just requests or rejects their request, right? But there are answers. Last week, we read the verses from the book of Revelation about God standing at the door and knocking. Uh, We know that the verses in early Matthew about asking, seeking, and knocking. We know that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness shall be filled. And there is a time uh, where we will know God face to face. Uh, not like through the smoky mirror that we see now. The time is coming. And God doesn't intend in the meantime for us to be running around clueless, uh, but we can't reject what he has given us and expect to be fully known or to fully know him or to know his will or to see more. In Luke 8, 16 through 18, part of our scripture reading today, I love this. Just says, no one after lighting a lamp covers it with a basket and puts it under a bed, but puts it on a lampstand so that those who come in may see its light. For nothing is concealed that won't be revealed and nothing hidden that won't be made known and brought to light. I love, listen to the next one. Therefore, take care how you listen. For whoever has will be given more and whoever does not have, even what he thinks he has will be taken away from him. Instead of being a doubting Thomas or asking, a flea, or asking for a fleece to throw out like Gideon, how about we walk with God? We come to know God and we do his will as we get to know him better day in, day out. You know what? For those of us who will believe, for those who will trust, for those who will respond to the invitation of God to become his follower, there is life and there is life eternal There is forgiveness of sins. It is not an empty religion. We have a God who is Savior. 
And so we don't just end up with a bunch of questions. We have a solution provided by God the Father through Jesus the Son. For those of us who will believe, we shall be saved. We shall be given eternity. Verse Peter 1, 8 and 9 says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you know not, though not seeing him now, you believe in him, and you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy, because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. You know what? Believing in Jesus brings answers. Oh, you don't know everything. You don't turn into God when you get saved. But you know how to make it to eternity. He gives you the strength to make it. He fills you and secures you with his Holy Spirit. And he gives you the answers that you need the most. How to be right with him and how to make it into eternity. Securely, confidently, assuredly. This week at youth camp, I I love the psalm that Mike, our youth director, read. uh, Psalm 34. And just one of those verses really touched me. Verse, Verse 9 says, You who are his holy ones, fear the Lord, for those who fear him lack nothing. And you know that verse so struck me. In, in, in the years that I have been counseling, in the years that I have, have seen people who have been faithful and who have lived long and, and blessed lives for the Lord, I have always seen that those who put God first are always blessed and always have what they need. Maybe not extra, and maybe times are still tough, but they, but they always do. And I see that with young people as well, for those that will put God above the, the pleasures of the world, and drugs, and alcohol, and self-indulgence, and greed. For those who will honor God with everything that they have. I've never met anybody that said, yes, I just wanted to honor God, and I lost everything. Uh, well, Job, but, uh, but that was different. He got it all back. Even then, God provided for him. God always takes care of us. Always. Those who spend their life following God have exactly what they need, and they get to live lives that are full of the glory of the Lord. And so today, I just simply ask you, what has God shown you? What has he shown you today? What's he shown you for the last several weeks? What's he shown you this year? What is it that God has shown you because as I keep saying, God never reveals himself to us for the, for the purpose of us knowing more. God always reveals himself to us so that we can respond to that revelation. It always demands a response. So if God is revealing himself to you, there must be a purpose behind that. So what is that purpose? What is it that God wants you to know? What is it that God wants you to do? What is it that God wants you to pray about? What is it that that God wants you to become so that he can be glorified through your life? Maybe you need to respond to him today. Maybe you need to respond to the revelation so that you can honor the king. And so maybe your prayer is like the man with the daughter who was sick. Lord, Help me overcome my belief. I do believe. But help me. Help me, Lord, so that I can follow you, so that I can be faithful. Let's be honest about it. You're not the first one that has ever struggled with belief. You're not the first one that has had, that has had the Satan put a, a, a whisper in your ear that has said, boy, that's a fantastic story. Are you sure that's true? And if that's where you're at today, you need to go back to the cross. And you need to ask God to strengthen your faith and to strengthen your heart so that you can hang on to the faith and the joy and the life that you're now experiencing. It could be, Lord, help me believe what you have shown me because maybe God wants you to take a step further. And maybe, just like Jesus' ministry, maybe it is very countercultural and and you're now struggling with how to deal with that. It could be that that you want God to reveal himself to you more and maybe you've dealt with what he's given you and so you need to come to the Lord in prayer and and open his word and you need to just seek him out and, and look for God to be revealed in his word. Look for God to be revealed in your circumstances, in your church, in your prayers, in your family and then respond to that. And it could be that God's asking you to take a huge step forward. 
to be obedient to his will, to come to know him personally and receive that gift of eternal life today. Or maybe it is to just take a step out and be a missionary on fire for him. And that could be in your workplace and it could be across the world. But it could be that God is laying a burden on your heart and that you need to follow that today. But whatever that is, know God and be blessed. Know God and be blessed. It really just doesn't get any better than that. Let us pray. Father, as we come before you again in prayer, we ask, Lord, that you would know us that you would reveal yourself to us, that you would help us to follow you, that you would help us to love you, that you would give us the faith to believe, that you would give us the courage to, to respond and the determination to be obedient to your perfect will. We pray, Lord, that you would touch our hearts. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to follow you. We pray, Lord, that if there's one in here that is struggling with a decision of revelation or of silence, that that today would be the day that they would return back to the throne, that they would ask forgiveness if there's something that they have missed or rejected, because we know, Lord, that if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Help us to be yours. Help us to love you. Help us. According to your blessed will, please, Lord, for the glory of your name, we give you all of the praise and all of the glory and all that we have in Jesus name. Amen.